welcome to Concert Pipeline. That's Yen Schickel. And that is Steve Jones. And Yen, today on the program, we have Bart and Stanley David, uh, who I had a chance to interview the other day. And I'm just going to put it on the table up front, OK? You ready for this? I am ready, man. <laughs> so uh, I made a mistake. Uh, and I, I live and die by my calendar, right? If it's on the calendar, I'm there, you know, I'm punctual. I'd, uh, I'm rarely ever late to anything. Uh, and it, when it comes to interviews, like never miss over anything, right? But this one, um, what I was on my lunch and uh, and I was talking to a friend and uh, and it wasn't on, on my calendar uh, that I was looking at uh, for the interview. And then I ended the call with a friend and I, saw it on my phone calendar and uh, I was like oh shit the interview oh <laughs> no okay. so it like didn't sync with your with your other calendar or they're just two different and, calendars no it's I mean it usually syncs but it didn't uh, sync with the other calendar for some reason and oh, so I called I call Barton's publicist I'm like I'm sorry I'm sorry she she was totally cool she's like it uh, it's okay it happens I'm like not to me it doesn't uh <laughs> right I know uh, there's a there's a level of excellence or you know even a moment of uh, or you know a pride thing it's like this does not happen to me that's where the embarrassment comes from right Look, I, I pride myself on my professionalism here right and right. you know and, and Barton was totally cool about it also and even at you know one point in the interview like you've done your homework and that always makes me feel good when they realize that I do my homework and I you know have done my research into having a good conversation with them so right. um, yeah so so it all worked out and I had no reason to share that other than, you know, uh, falling on my sword and accountability, uh, which that's just who I am. So <laughs> it sounds like you're still feeling guilty about it. But you know what? Just look, blame, it's, the, blame the calendar. It's off my chest now. Oh, it's definitely my fault. I, I can't just l rely on full technology. I have to know, you know, you're only as strong as, you know, yourself or something. I don't know what I'm saying. Your uh, team, but, right. And your calendar yeah, yeah. is like part of the team. But it also sounds, Steve, like you might need some closure on this. Yeah, how are we doing that? I don't know. Maybe uh, okay. we're doing that by kind of. I thought that's what this is. Admitting, you know, what kind of what happened, sharing, and you know, getting through the pod without any other technical difficulties. That's the plan. <laughs> we're going to keep moving forward, keep flowing forward. Yeah, you have a you have a story you wanted to share with me. Yeah, I got this silly little story that uh, I wanted to, sh to 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 share. Um, I kind of had a I don't want to say senior moment because that just makes me feel old. But I had one of these, like, what just happened or what did I just do moments? Um, so this was, I don't know, this was a while back. Last time I was at Costco. Um, had to make a Costco run and um, had to kind of, you know, multitask a bit uh, because I was on dog duty. So I brought the dog with me. And um, you're one was... of those that takes your dog into Costco, aren't you? You know what? I actually was able to sneak my dog into Costco once or twice or and they busted stuff. me. You guys don't let your dog out of your sight. You guys are just like make that dog so dependent. I know it's it's pretty sad. You know we're being we're doing the dog I think a big disservice from by bringing him everywhere. But he does really well um, when he's in his little crate and mm -hmm. uh, he's in the car. So he likes that. He just chills, hangs out, can totally be by himself. Doesn't you know, bark or anything. He's just chill. And uh, so uh, this was uh, like, I don't know, a month ago, it was after work. Um, so I'm like, okay, I'm gonna, dog needs to take a walk. I'm just gonna go to Costco, park, take the dog around the, you know, walk on the, around the entire shopping center. Uh, he likes that. And then um, put the dog in the car and then, you know, go to Costco for like half an hour and come back. Okay, so I knew it was gonna get dark, right? Uh -huh. yeah. So I figured by the time I get to Costco, uh, there's gonna be daylight left, but by the time we're done with the walk, um, you know, it's gonna be dark. So I better, be, you know, better be prepared for that. So, you know, I put on my, I put on my awesome walking hat, right? Okay, so like, yep, okay yep. I got my walking hat on. And then uh, when I take the dog for, the, for a walk, it's really nice to have two hands free. I want for the leash and the other one for, you know, poop bags or whatever. So I always walk around with this little headlight, right? <laughs> like You're prepared. I'm, I'm prepared, you know? It kind of looks like I'm uh, 
mining and you mining. Know, yes, <laughs> thank you. That's that's what the Lord I was looking for. Like I'm mining, right? So here I am, you know, with my little light on, do 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 do, and uh, uh, oh, that's different brightness. <laughs> Okay, anyway, so, <laughs> so really uh, you know, the, full picture, I like it. <laughs> I know, thank you. So I like, you know, I like the visuals, uh, helps you kind of um, imagine the scene, right? So here I am with the leash. I don't have the leash, you know, here with me, but you know, you could know the leashes. So here I'm like walking the dog with the leash and doing a little thing, saying hi to other people, they're walking their dogs. Um, and we had just an awesome walk. He was really excited about it. Um, you know, super efficient. And I'm like, okay, good. We got, you know, his energy out. He should sleep well. Don't have to worry about the dog anymore. Uh, went to the car, opened, uh, you know, opened the door, put the dog in his crate. He was super excited. He curled up right away. Um, zipped the crate up, like this little travel cape, travel cloth, super comfy travel cr crate that you use on airplanes and stuff. Uh, closed the door. I did lock the door and I did take the keys with me. And Steve, you know, that there was at least one time where I might not have done that and I might have left the car running. Uh huh. Yes, yes, I do know about that. Uh, I can't monkeys. believe that actually <laughs> happened. I think I was set up, but uh, I did, I did, uh, you know, lock the door, I had the keys, put the keys in my pocket. I'm like, okay, here we go to Costco. Went to Costco, I, you know, I got my card out. Here's my card, I'm a Costco member, got the card, you know, and, up and, and when I go to Costco, I go up and down every single aisle. I don't got, have can't to miss do an that. aisle. No. You can't miss an eye. I just, I just like looking at the new things, you know? So um, I didn't want to spend that much time at Costco. I was like, okay, half an hour. So I went up and down every single aisle, got the 10 things I needed, went out the door, um, uh, opened the back of the car, put all the groceries in there, uh, put the cart away, uh, got into the driver's front seat. And I was like, oh, I still got my hat on. Better take my hat off. I had my light on still. Okay, so you walked around all of Costco with your light on? Well, thank, thankfully, the light light wasn't on, but it was still on my head. Uh -huh. Oh, you were you were walking around Costco with the with the so physical like walking line. around like this. Uh huh. Yeah. And nobody said anything. You would think that somebody would <laughs> no, say no. something. People parted very well, though. You know, They're, and it wasn't just the six foot social distance that were you know, suggested. It was. It was like, right. 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 right exactly. You're that guy. You, and there I'm sitting like so embarrassed, you know, what did I just do? I just walked all around every aisle at Costco with my headlight on my head. Nobody uh -huh. said anything. I was trying to replay, you know, the whole experience. Like, were people avoiding me? Were people looking at me weird? Like, no, it was just, I was just normal. Like, do people walk in with, no, you know, doing no, weird just... things like that? I mean, it's not Walmart, you know, where you see right. people dressed inappropriately whereas something like that might be you know normal. totally normal um so i don't know yeah senior moment I, I like your story but let's tell it one more time but with the light actually on why is, is you're walking up and down the aisles <laughs> all right so here i am i'm like walking up the, up the aisle okay gonna get toilet paper <laughs> yeah get some bread gonna get some fish Got to get some mixed nuts. Not oblivious to, to how you're lighting up the aisle. <laughs> totally oblivious, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That is it. Anyway, that's my embarrassing that's, moment of the year. Yeah, it was a great so, story. So you know what? You were embarrassed about your calendar. Yeah. I'm embarrassed uh, that I'm making a fool of myself in public. One more embarrassment uh, before we bring in Barton, and uh, and I think that's enough embarrassment for uh, <laughs> the episode. The, the embarrassment is it, last week when we uh, recorded the pod, we did make an oath to the concert pipeline viewers oh that, my God. Uh, that right. we would be reviewing uh, a certain movie with uh, Dave Grohl, Studio 666, um, which uh, features Dave Grohl and the Foo Fighters in a comedy horror film. Uh, and um, and we wanted to go together uh, and we actually had a chance, you know, my kids are, would be with their stepdad and their their mom who is back from England and everything. And we were like, okay, we'll get uh -huh. together and go see it. And there was, Quite literally, one showing um, at the theater at your uh, in your town where we were uh, where I was visiting you, uh, and it was mm -hmm. at eight forty at night. And I don't think either of us was lasting that long until uh, <laughs> no, right. And I don't think we actually realized that when we committed. We didn't to watching that well, show. This is, this is week two of the movie. It just you know we talked last week about how the movie bombed, and I mean it. They pulled it quick. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, I still would have liked to have seen it, um, and yeah. uh, but by the time I can, I'm sure it's going to be gone by this weekend or whatever. So, 
a, a video on demand. Well, sometime in the next year. <laughs> we'll see it. Yeah, we'll circle back eventually when this is, you know, available. That's our video on demand or, you know, if one of the streaming services picks it up or something. Uh, and I'm we will come back and we will review it. I still think it has redeeming factors. I'm sure the audience score on it is pretty strong, but that's probably a lot of Foo Fighters fans as well who are targeted. Yeah. But that's that's this present company included. So, um, so that's that's good. You know, if you are a Foo Fighters fan or Dave Grohl fan, it's worth. I'm sure it's worth watching just based on that audience score alone. Yes. So more to come on that and whenever in the future we'll, we'll see but <laughs> um, <laughs> so maybe we'll get back to you uh, on this in six months or in a year from now or whatever <laughs> absolutely well well let's go ahead and let's bring in our guest again this is barton barton stanley david he has a new album called crest that's coming out april 22nd so mark your calendars uh and uh and make sure to check out that new album uh, i've given it a couple of listens uh i dig it it's good stuff and uh we're gonna bring barton on in thank thank you for your flexibility um and an understanding i appreciate that uh, no problems uh, no problem you know, it's, we're yeah, it's a crazy today. time <laughs> believe me i i, I get it <laughs> well how how is it for you how are you holding up how are things uh things going for you good man thank you for asking we're you know here in texas and uh have some crazy weather here it's you know snowing one day and hot the next day uh so it's, it's, what is that what is that like right <laughs> yeah it's uh it's right for you guys yeah it's it's uh it's interesting but um doing good everything's good down here and and uh yeah excited to be getting some music out finally yeah so how long have you been back in texas uh i moved back here in 2019 so we've been here about three years okay what what inspired the move back from from new york i think just 10 years in new york you know that's um, all you needed. Just so you're like, I got a decade yeah. in me, and that's it. <laughs> yeah, I think. So. I mean, I love New York so much, especially those first. I think everybody that moves there, those first few years are really magical when you when you first get there. Uh, and then you know, also just getting older, you have less tolerance for some of the craziness of the city. And and um, I've been trying to move back for. Two, it took me about two or three years to to move back. I, I'd been wanting to come back to Texas for a while. And finally, um, my wife and I, a few years after we had met, there was some back and forth, but we, we saw our window and decided we wanted to jump through it. Yeah. So you met your wife in New York, like near the end of the New York time, right? I did. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I had tried to move back here around 2018 and, uh, and came back for a bit and we had met a little less than a year before that. Uh, and so a lot of the record, a lot of the songs ended up being about that time. Um, I ended up going back to the city after about three or four months here. And the two of us moved in together in Brooklyn. Um, and then we finally moved back together about a year after that. So it was a lot of dramatic back and forth. Yeah, but you're here to stay, you're, uh, you're, you're you know. Who knows, we, you know, it's a strange, <laughs> I think everybody has some love hate with their hometown. And so uh, it's been great being back. It's also in some ways it's, it's kind of strange. So uh, we'll see, but yeah, the foreseeable future we are, we are here. Yeah. Uh, so tell me about, uh, about growing up, what music were you into as a, a kid? Um, I know you, your dad was yeah. a college DJ, right? He was. Yeah. Um, I mean, so much, you know, I started with, uh, everything from classical my dad was a big soul guy so I, I had a lot of Bobby Womack records and Gil Scott Heron and and stuff like that and then a lot of classic rock like Neil Young and Buffalo Springfield uh and um some pretty niche stuff too like Nectar which is a German prog rock group was a big deal for me but um and classical too I loved Ravel and Aaron Copeland and um that didn't come from my dad but uh, so a lot of stuff at a really, a really young age. Yeah. Was your mom uh, an influence on you at all musical? No, she would probably be first to tell you she's not a musical. She loves music, but, uh, no, nobody really didn't, nobody really, my dad sings, uh, sings in a cover band. Um, but nobody else really played an instrument, wrote songs. It, it was kind of a, a, uh, a rare thing. For our what sort of cover what sort of cover band is your dad he does he does you know the yacht rock classic rock 
he's a great singer, my dad. Uh, and I think since the pandemic, he's, he's a little bummed out that they haven't had any gigs, but uh, him and his buddy have been playing this stuff for like 30 years together. And they'll, yeah. any, any place that'll let them play, they do it. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, did you, so you, guitar was your first instrument or did, was it piano? Uh, I've never taken any, I've never had any instruction on either, but I, I was playing piano uh, just by ear when I was a little kid, four or five, I, I would sit there and kind of figure things out. Um, and then I did play saxophone and French horn when I was in grade school, uh, but gave that up, you know, pretty quick. And uh, yeah, and just started, I found my brother had taken guitar lessons and, and, um, and then stopped and there was a guitar laying around. And so I was about 14 and picked it up, started playing and my, my buddies and I started teaching each other Smashing Pumpkins and Toadie songs and, and that's kind of how it started. Yeah. And so did you, did you form like a high school, normal high school band or just mostly play with your brother? Uh, I had it. Yeah. I even had a band even before that. Uh, I can't remember what the name was, but we never played anywhere. We just jammed. Um, and I never, yeah, never really did the band thing. I was doing my, my own thing. Uh, as soon as I started writing songs and, you know, when I lived in Austin, I was doing open mics and recording with the Tascam four track. And, and that kind of thing yeah and you started writing songs around that same time around age 14 too right i did yeah and, and so what what did those songs sound like what, tell me about kind of how you express yourself at that point in your life uh i think there i've got some of that stuff laying around and i think it's very 90s um, yeah <laughs> yeah i mean in some of them you know what i went back to it recently and it was it was better than i i was expecting it to be really bad uh, and it wasn't that bad for a kid that was like 15, 16, using like a, a handheld tape recorder. But uh, they were kind of acoustic. I was very into Nick Drake at that age um, and also really into all the no depression stuff. I was like a huge, I had all the Uncle Tupelo stuff on cassette. So it was kind of in that vein. I mean, not too far from where it is now, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, but um, so um, so at what point did you kind of start recording your yourself and kind of be like, okay, this is something I can, you know, I want to release, I want to get this out there and kind of, be, mm -hmm. you know, start to have my own career musically. Sure. Probably in my early 20s, I, I, I went to school at University of Texas in Austin, but I didn't really go to school. I mean, I wasn't there that much. Um, it was Austin. And so I spent a lot of time at, uh, there's a great venue down there on that campus called the Cactus. Um, and they had really great people coming through all the time. Cindy Cash Dollar and, and Jimmy Lefebvre and Willis Allen Ramsey. And so I spent a lot of that time just going to shows and then started uh, doing open mics there. There's one called the Root of Maya. I'm not sure if it's there anymore. Um, and, and started recording, recording myself uh, using like pirated software and stuff. And then eventually made my way into a studio in Dallas with, um, I don't know if you remember the band Deep Blue Something. A little bit, yeah. They had the Breakfast at Tiffany's. Was like okay, big, okay. That was their big yeah. 90s hit. I was um, like, where did I hear that? I, yeah. Those guys had a studio in Dallas and I did some stuff there. And so that was kind of early 20s when I first wanted to really make a go of it as a career. Yeah. Uh, and kind of living in that Dallas to, uh, Austin Austin area did you ever go to any of the big festivals like uh South by Southwest and Austin yeah. City Limits like for sure I I mean I used to go to South by in high school when I couldn't even we had like fake IDs I think I saw yeah. Wil Wilco there like in 99 or something but um yeah I went to South by every year but it was funny because all the I actually haven't been to South by in a long time and I know it's changed a lot, but uh, what was funny is all these bands from all over the world, it's the one week they would come to Austin, but I, I always ended up at the Austin showcase with Lyle Lovett and, and Eliza Gilkison and all the Austin people, because uh, yeah. they were great. Yeah, and were, uh, were there any other songwriters that you kind of latched onto that kind of helped you define your, your style? Uh, just as people that I admired or people I'd met, you mean 
Yeah, yeah. Like that I've met in person. Yeah, exactly. And you're like, hey, we can we can kind of work together. Uh, and I was pretty lone wolf with that stuff, um, and had pretty pretty you know formed ideas. Uh, I love collaborating with people, but I, in terms of writing my own stuff, I it it comes to me kind of fully formed, and I'm. Uh, I mean, I'm, I always love getting feedback from people, but I was not like seeking out people to collaborate with. Um, I did have a, my, my friend, Douglas Edward, who's a violin player and composer was kind of one of my first bandmates collaborators. Um, and he's fantastic. He plays violin and, and uh, viola and, and some lap steel. And so he was great, a great person to bounce ideas off of. Yeah. Um, so I saw you did a, uh, a direct to vinyl record back in 2018. That seemed pretty yeah, interesting yeah. to me. Tell me, tell me yeah. how, what that is, how that came about. Uh, they, that's called least of all. And I think they're still going pretty strong. Um, I'm not sure honestly how they found me, but, uh, they reached out and I went to their studio in Williamsburg and it's, uh, they have like their own vinyl lathe and it's just, yeah, direct, you know, they set up a little mic and um, some kind of bare bones studio equipment and it's direct to vinyl. You can watch the record spinning while you're recording. Um, and it sounds great. I've got it laying around somewhere. Um, but yeah, that was a cool experience. That was right. Uh, I think that was just a couple of days before I moved out of the city. Yeah. So you had to have it fully fledged before you go in. How many times did you like, mm -hmm. practice it before you... Uh, I think I ran it a couple times. I remember I did a song called Motorbike that's uh, a single that's floating around, yeah. which is about Texas also. And um, uh, yeah, it's like uh, you're used to that, you know, when you spend enough time in a recording studio and on stage, it was kind of a, a one and done. It was it's nice for me because I I sort of over uh, I don't need everything to be perfect, but uh, definitely hammer things pretty hard in the studio. So it's it's always fun to just capture a real, a real moment, you know? Yeah. Were you pretty happy with how it turned out? Yeah. I thought it was very cool. I mean, it's got that saturated vinyl sound to it. You know, it's not hi-fi. Um, yeah. But it's got its own character and it sounds great. Yeah. So you talked about 90s music and being a big influence on you, Smashing Pumpkins. Um, mm -hmm. I know you did a Nirvana tribute uh, as yeah. well. Tell me a little bit about that. Good man, did your homework. Um, I almost forgot about that. Yeah, we did, you know, we did my buddy Paul in New York. Uh, for about two years, we did a series of benefits uh, at Rockwood Music Hall. And so every uh, once a month, you know, it was for a lot of different benefits. Um, we did a back to back Leonard Cohen tribute was kind of our big hit there where they had to like book another night and uh, but the Nirvana thing was one of them. We you know we did Tom Petty, we did um, yeah. all kinds of stuff, but that was fun. I have to say that Nirvana was not my band when I was that yeah. age. Like I, I love them, but I was more, Alice in Chains was kind of my, my thing as like an angsty, you know, 15 year old kid with choker and rings and the whole bit. Yeah. Uh, but the Nirvana thing was fun, you know, and Kurt Cobain's, you know, tall order uh but people seem to like it it was it was great did you take vocals and you, you did this i singing? did yeah i sang uh i think we sang heart shaped box um the problem is we did it you know we did it in a room that's kind of known for being acoustically really great and perfect and so when you bring drums down there and, and rock out i was i was kind of in a silent movie with the vocals yeah. they you know but uh it was great. I had people really, people really dug it. And it, I think it brings back a lot of great memories. How was the Tom Petty tribute? That was great. Um, Tom Petty, weirdly enough, you know, was my first, I think that was my first concert I ever saw live. I was oh, like that's awesome. yeah. 14. Yeah. In, in Dallas, I saw, uh, it was him and the Jayhawks. And I think I was probably more excited about the Jayhawks at the time, but uh, Petty was amazing. And uh, yeah, so the tribute we did for him was really great. I think that was the year he passed away, before, right before he passed away. So that was kind of wow. strange. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, no, that's that's pretty cool um, that you you got a chance to, to do that sort of thing. He's it was great, and actually, one of the it's a weird full circle thing. Dave Schiffman, who worked on the album, worked with the Jayhawks and Tom Petty, kind of really? early in his career. Yeah, so it was really cool. That that felt like a a full circle moment, you know. Did he share anything about working with Petty? You know, he really didn't. I mean, I definitely I need to fan out on him a little bit and ask him about some some of that stuff because he I know he recorded Chris Cornell's vocals for the first Audio Slave album um, he was there on those Wildflowers sessions with Rick Rubin and at some point I got to ask him about it uh, and I'm sure he's he's got plenty of stories yeah yeah that's pretty cool and that's I mean what a cool first first concert for you too I mean yeah. it was great you know a lot of um, the kids the the my partner in the label who I'm making the, uh, who's helping me with the record was about four years ahead of me in school. And I think he was there too, which is strange. And his, um, what I remember is a kid from his class got arrested for, uh, he was on acid and was freaking out. And uh, wow. it was a weird memorable. You're like a freshman, you go see the older kids and they're getting handcuffed and taken out on a stretcher. It was kind of a, <laughs> a weird thing but it, it was memorable. Yeah, yeah. I've gotten to see T Petty live like three times. Um, wow. Yeah, um, once the tour before he died um, and mm -hmm. he, he came here to, to Napa, did a festival. And it's one of those you kick yourself sort of thing because uh, I, I yeah. left halfway through because it was such a big festival. There was, you know, tens of thousands of people and I'm so far back and you compare yeah. it to what you've experienced before. Like I saw him in 05 and 06. Mm -hmm. um and um and i had photo passes and he does this thing where you know it's you know typically the photo pass you get the first three songs or what have you of a band right. set but he does right. this thing where you, you could stay in the pit for the whole set you know right. which yeah that's i'm not cool. going to not do that right so yeah sure <laughs> so that's amazing so, so i was closer in front row for two you know seeing him two years in a row and so i was mm. like ah this doesn't you know but to, i should have stayed for the whole set you know <laughs> yeah no that's <laughs> great though that's awesome that you saw that uh he was a big influence on this album. You know, I, I never, I, I, as much as I loved him, I never counted him as like a big influence. Yeah. And it was, it was really, maybe it was because of that tribute, but the, that year, 2017, when I was writing a lot of the songs and right before he passed away, I got on a huge Tom Petty kick and was watching Running Down a Dream, the movie uh, on a loop and, and listening to some of his older stuff that I hadn't really dug into and like the mud crutch stuff and you know he really was special yeah yeah he was, he was pretty great um yeah so tell me about your uh your cover of uh cars drive uh because that's gotten a lot of traction yeah that um that was kind of a, just a one-off i i played it at a friend's wedding uh up in woodstock uh just on a whim and I, I always love that. I think every kid of a certain age, like I remember seeing that video on MTV all the time. And uh, it was cool because it was Benjamin Orr that was singing it. And you're like, oh, they got the other guy doing it. And um, so I, I love that song. And uh, and it was a big wedding. I think there were like 500 people there and and it, everybody really loved it. My, my best friend, Danny, who's also a, a musician, he kept asking because i want to let's we're going to record that i'm going to produce that and i'm going come on man we got we you know i don't think i can add anything new here like that's untouchable uh but we went in over the summer like a couple different studios in, in new york and and uh and did it and, it and it was a lot of fun and then it picked up um yeah just some organic radio traction which was great yeah, yeah. And some here in the, the Bay Area also on K pop. That's right. Yeah. 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 Rosalie, she's, you know, uh, yeah, that was great. That was a real kick to hear, to hear her introduce it. And I was streaming it. That was, that was, that was fun to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you had your uh, Blue for East Broadway EP. Um, and mm -hmm. I, I listened to that and I, and I dig it. And it's, uh, it's got a different, it's got a different feel than than your new album, which we'll, we'll talk about in just a minute. But um, tell me, tell me, kind of what you were the approach you were going for when you went into that album and uh, and your mm -hmm. process of making it. 
Um, that was, you know, that was my big New York record. Uh, and a, a lot of it was influenced. You know, I wrote a lot of it. I got really lucky in that when I moved to the city, I kept getting, uh, finding these rent controlled sublets, which is like a, like a lightning striking in New York. Um, but they were really dated. I mean, I like appliances from like the sixties and the floor was coming up and like, um, but it was really inspiring. So I wrote a lot of that album in this really old apartment I was living in, in the Lower East Side. Um, and I made it in Brooklyn at a place called Letterman with uh, a composer named Dan Teicher who was co-producing. And then a kind of a big win for me at that stage is I, I cold called John Aniello, who's a, a really great indie producer that I mean, I loved, I mentioned all the, he worked with Sunvolt, all these Buffalo Tom, like all these records I grew up with um, and Sonic Youth and Dinosaur Jr. And so uh, I ended up mixing with him and his regular studio was blocked out. Like this was a weird one, not a surf. I didn't even know they were still doing their thing. Uh-huh. Uh, he's like, we can't go to my studio because not a surf blocked it out for two months. Um, so we went to this place called Flexivity that had this amazing, it was a, 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 the technician from Sear Sound. I can't remember his name anymore, but he's uh, started his own studio with just gear he had accumulated. And the centerpiece was uh, a Neve board that George Martin used to own that he had at Air Studios for a long time. And uh, so we mixed on this beautiful uh, vintage Neve board with, these Fairchild compressors that the Beatles had used and, and just some crazy kind of dream vintage stuff. But uh, yeah, it's, it, it definitely was like more of a folk kind of soul vibe than, uh, yeah. than what I'm doing these days. But um, yeah, great memories of, of making it. Uh, and then not to go on too much, but I had a, I had a, like a ortho, uh, had a really bad shoulder injury right after it came out and had to have open uh. surgery and so it kind of collected dust i didn't really get a chance to to, to the, i think the first show i did with those songs was like a year after i put it out yeah. so I, I you, had to wait, to, you had to wait a while you couldn't play on it like you you wanted to or yeah, yeah it was just kind of a weird you know bad luck but uh but yeah great memories of making it and and um still like listening to it yeah yeah and I, I wanted to ask you about kind of your experience moving to New York too, because I knew you moved there with nothing. You had your like a backpack and your and your guitar, yeah. and that was that was it, bare bones. Like, how yeah. nerve wracking was that for you to move halfway across the country to it, it with yeah, just it, that? It was. I mean, it's kind of a cliche, you know, the suitcase and the guitar, but it really was that. I mean, I was trying for a long time to um, to move to the city, and could never seem to find. A place that I could afford and um and at some point I just was I knew that I I really wanted to be there and uh and so I just booked a one-way ticket and and found a sublet for I think it was only good for a couple of days and then uh couch surfed with um I mean I had a couple of acquaintances people were really generous then uh and finally found a like a sublet for a couple months but I was, I was kind of famous in New York among my friends. I was, that was the thing I was known for is I never had a place to live. I was always like bouncing around. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it was so, I think, you know, I it was more exciting. It definitely, there were some moments that were tough, but uh, I also got lucky that I found a, I found a job right when I got there. Um, I was working at a community center as a, as a personal trainer. And so that helped. And then, and then pretty quickly with the music scene um, found, you know, some, I, I met some really great people and was tight with them pretty quick. So it always, community is always helpful, you know? Yeah. Were there any memorable shows from your time in New York that you went to that, uh, that you're like, oh, this is, this is incredible. Uh, gosh. You know, I, I was such a fly on the wall. I went to the living room a lot. Um, I remember seeing Freddie Johnston there, who I I was a big fan of and got to know him a little bit. Um, there were a lot of secret shows that would happen at Rockwood. So like Nora Jones 
who's also from Dallas. She would pop up every so often. Uh, Sting did like a secret set once that I caught. And um, maybe the coolest was Greg Allman. He's, yeah. He was one of my heroes and, and he turned up one night, uh, which was pretty amazing. And there were not that many people there to see it. So, so you're uh, able to see them in this tiny place sort of thing, right? Like, yeah, we have a, a funny stories that there was a bartender friend of ours uh, who was also a, like a singer songwriter and he liked to drink a lot and he used to make all kinds of claims that he, that Bono was a good friend of his and Glenn Hansard. And we're like, yeah, okay, great. Uh, and so I ran to him on the street and he said he was going to the living room and that I should come check it out that they were doing this thing. And I think I was working, so I, I, I didn't make it, but sure enough, it was Bono and, uh, and Glenn Hansard and I forget who else. And um, maybe Sarah, no, I can't remember, but um, yeah, he, he wasn't kidding. They were, they actually- so he, he was friends with Bono. <laughs> he was, and they, there's all these, I'm dying seeing all these pictures of Bono in this little room, you know? Uh, yeah. But that's, that was what was great about New York. You know, you would, you could, um, I remember Billy Joe Armstrong another time. I can't say I was ever like a huge Green Day fan, but. Uh, he did like a little secret thing. He just got up and grabbed the guitar and, and started doing a bunch of Green Day hits. You know, it was, uh, that's cool. It was great. Yeah. Yeah. I'm ki I, I kicked myself a little bit because I went down to visit a friend in LA the weekend of the Super Bowl. Uh, just coincidentally uh, happened mm -hmm. to be there and then realized the Super Bowl was happening there. And, uh, right. and so there were Green Day was playing and, and I was like, oh my God, it's going to be just, all, you know, whatever their newest stuff is that's not right. not crazy about right garbage right. i'm like pass right <laughs> right but, i mean it'd be, like it'd be cool to see but you know if they mix that in some of the older stuff but not worth mm -hmm. sitting through all the, the new stuff and then i look yeah. afterwards at their set list which was just like all the best three day right. songs you could have and then covers that were awesome I that's law, cool. all, all that right you know and, yeah sure and i'm like oh gosh should have gone yeah but, that's all right maybe get another yeah. chance Maybe, maybe, yeah. you know, but, uh, you know, sometimes you, you, you go yeah. to some and you, you make it and you, you miss some and yeah. Yeah. I've, I've, yourself. I've had a few of those for sure. Yeah. There's another one. It was Prince, like his, one of his last shows is here in the Bay area and at a mm. small place. And I like, I was like, I put the ticket in the cart, you know, sort of thing, but I'm like, it's too mm. expensive. I can't, I can't afford it. It was like at the back yeah. of the venue. I'm like, I don't sit back at the venue. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and, yeah. and then, then you find out a couple of days later and like, mm -hmm. should have gone. Sort of Those thing, are right? funny. So, yeah. I mean, I had some funny, uh, there was a bar we used to hang out at and we were sitting there late one night on a weeknight. And my cellist is one of my closest friends. And, uh, I was talking to somebody else and he started squeezing my arm and I, I kind of ignored him. And then he kept squeeze me i go what what is your problem what he goes robert plant sitting next to you the next to i'm like what he goes robert plant is sitting next to you and i turned around and he was right next to me at the bar you know with like the leather jacket yeah. and the you know it was robert plant and uh yeah. stuff like that was was is always kind of surreal yeah did you talk to him no we left him alone but he was yeah. he was there uh yeah, I know I wasn't about I, I wasn't about to uh, introduce myself. Yeah, guy. But yeah, yeah, because <laughs> yeah, it was clear he was you know it was a weeknight he was kind of keeping it low key but I think hard to hard to blend in when you're Robert Plant. Yeah, yeah, a little tougher. Um, so let's talk about Crest, right? Uh, so sure. um, com comes out in April. Um, like the when, I know you part of this you started like six years ago uh, some some of the songs right mm -hmm. um yes. and um and so it's been developing over this time and you kind of wanted it to be around this idea of crest tell me tell me where yeah. crest comes from uh so that most of them are pretty recent the the title track crest is the oldest one and that was that was back yeah in like 2014 maybe um I so I wrote that for my best friend Danny he had, um, I've mentioned him before, he's a singer. He actually wrote a song for me uh, that was really great. It was called Smile in the World Smiles Back. And uh, I saw him, <clears throat> he played it the first time he played it live. That was what I thought the title was. And he introduced it to like a full room. He goes, this song is called Barton. 
And everybody turned around and looked at me and I'm going, oh man, this is not what I thought uh-huh. we were calling it. But uh, so it was kind of, uh, um, some of that had to do with him. It was about our, our kind of parallel journeys together, like as artists in the city. Uh, and then it became more of a universal thing. Um, you know, he and I used to talk about kind of a, not to get too esoteric, but like, you know, ants who are building something who don't know what they're building. You know, we're building this thing. We don't know what it is. And, and some of technology, um, it, it just felt like there, and it's still, at least to me, it feels like it's heading towards, you know, all this, um, you know, what we're doing right now, the way we, everybody's communicating, it just seems like this is all head, headed towards um, some kind of a, an end game um, or a crest. And uh, so that was part of it. And then uh, I knew I wanted to call the record crest. So I didn't, you know, intentionally did not record that song until I was, until I had an album worth of material. Uh, and then by the time, you know, by the time we were ready to record it, it, it took on kind of an even broader meeting. So when I went in to, to sing it, I was thinking more in these broad societal terms, you know? Yeah. And you said it's kind of about being torn between two places, right? Like I imagine New York and yeah. Dallas kind of. Yeah. Where you're Cicada, that. The, the single specifically, I was had written that when um, I had tried to move back to Dallas and my wife, she was still living in the Bronx at the time and, and, um, and was really upset. You know, we w- stayed together and, and the plan was maybe at some point she'd come to Texas, but um, just those few months apart were really tough. And uh, I, I knew I didn't want to be back in New York long term, but uh, it definitely didn't feel right being apart from her either. Uh, so some of that, some of that, uh, a couple of the songs came out of that time period. Yeah. And yeah. just being torn between two places. Yeah. Um, and so you, you work with Jeff Sands on this, uh, this album, right? So tell me about the dynamic there and, um, and kind of how that relationship kind of uh, came about. What, he, what did he bring out of the, the album? Oh, gosh. I mean, a lot. It's really hard to... Producers, sometimes I feel like for people that, that uh, aren't musicians, it's, they're, they're curious, like, what does a producer do, you know? Um, Jeff, I met back in 2018 when I first tried to move to Dallas and uh, saw his studio, Modern Electric, which is an amazing place. Um, especially as somebody that grew up there, we didn't have anything like that. When I, I mean, there were studios in Dallas, but um, his gear and the space, it's actually an old jingle space. It was used for commercials back in the 50s. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I knew I wanted to work with Jeff. I had heard stuff that he had done and just really um admired kind of his sense of space and um everything he did to me just sounded like a record that's like a thing you can't quite put your finger on uh and so he and i were talking um you know i felt bad because i told him i want to make a record with him then i went back to new york uh so when i got back here around the time of the pandemic we started working together on this album and um yeah just his his level of commitment and um his taste and, and uh, I don't think I'd, I worked with some really great people, but I'm almost always the guy that says, let's, let's do it again. Let's now let's try it again. Let's try something else. Uh, there was stuff that I was going to let ride. And Jeff's like, I think we can do it better than that. Or why don't we try this? Why don't we not? You know what? We could do this. Um, and, and, you know, he's, he just was so committed and so, um, I mean, we worked on three songs for six months, so that that should tell you kind of how like in the weeds we got. Um, and he was willing to try anything. I mean, hauling like big, there was one guitar sound we were looking for and we tried like eight different amp setups. I think I pushed him to his limit there. Even he was ready to be like, all right, let's, let's pick a horse and run with it. But um, yeah, he just was so committed and, and um, and we were also just like psychic. I think he and I are about the same age. And so we were kind of psychically lo- locked in on what we thought this could be and what we wanted it to sound like, which was also 
um, I mean, I'm, I've been lucky. I'm always on the same page with people I've, I've made music with, but we were really locked in on even the smallest things. So uh, yeah. it was amazing to, to have him. Yeah. Um, you have a song on the album called Eve Evelyn. Um, mm -hmm. And that's uh, about um, a friend of yours who was start, uh, started out as a friend, we became a girlfriend, mm -hmm. back, to, back to a friend sort of thing. Yes. Tell me, tell yeah. me kind of how that uh, dynamic panned out and, um, mm -hmm. and built into, you know, you creating this song. Yeah, we, um, Eve, so she goes by Evie mostly. Okay. Um, I don't know why she's not, you know, the Evelyn thing, uh, I, people have, I listen, I have it with my name, but it's not a secret, but mostly she sticks to Evie. And uh, yeah, we were friends and, and, um, and dated for a time. And it was kind of a funny, lighthearted thing. Um, I mean, it sounds, I, I never, I don't mean to say I didn't take it seriously, but it was just a very kind of uh, just a fun, innocent time. And, um, yeah. and we went back to being friends and around. Um, she actually had a long, like a on and off long-term boyfriend that was living in San Francisco. Mm, okay. And uh, I think they got back to, I can't, I can't remember kind of what, you know, eventually things do it kind of petered out and, and, uh, and that song came really quickly. It was like in 10 minutes and, uh, and there were some kind of inside jokes in there. And, uh, I would, I wanted to wait until I had recorded it to, to show it to her, which ended up being like five years after I wrote it. So it took, took a little while. Um, but she's still a great friend where we talk all the time and, and, um, her and my wife are friends and, and, I finally sent her the song when it was finished and, and she was very uh, emotional. It was a really nice, a nice thing. Yeah. She, she appreciated it, right? It didn't come off. She loved it. She's always, you know, her favorite. I mean, she sent all her family and, and uh, it was funny because some other friends, I had heard it like some mutual friends. And so she was like the last person to hear the Evie song was Evie, you know? Uh, yeah. But yeah, it was, we, you know, we talked a lot about it and, and uh, it meant a lot to me that, that, that she really loves it, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, so what's next, Martin? What's, uh, what do you, do you have a tour planned around the album? What are you, what are you uh, going to do a record release in New York um, on April 22nd, which is when the, the full album comes out. Um, and then still working on a Texas date. We we're, we're kind of trying to do a, um, a specific thing here and gonna do it it's just the dates uh with the virus and everything a couple months ago it was getting hairy and and um so some hiccups there but uh gonna do also a release show here uh and then yeah working on some some regional touring stuff hopefully gonna play a show in la um and maybe san diego uh and san francisco would be great i don't know uh if that'll happen but gonna try yeah all right. I hope you uh, hope you're able to get out this way. It would be cool to uh, to see the songs played live. And uh, thanks, Steve. Yeah, uh, that'd be great. Yeah, digging the new album as well. So uh, thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, we're gonna try to. to I think it, it seems like things are opening up, and and uh, the sun's peeking out a little bit on live music. So it's you know it's a different feel. It's like it's this you you dip your toe into the water a little bit, right? Like you know, I mean, I. I still mostly worn masks in stores and everything because it feels weird mm -hmm. not to. But yeah. then at the same time, I looked at the COVID cases and it's like there was one in Napa, one case of Napa wow. or something. Yeah. I'm like, I think I think I'm okay. I think know, you're good. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's it's different because Texas. It is different. Um, it's been a little yeah. more lax here. Uh, but yeah, hopefully, um, gonna go back to some sense of normal. Yeah. It's, I mean, definitely need more concerts and getting out to live shows and everything. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It's actually, it's been for me a couple of years since I've been on stage. So I'm ready to, yeah. to rock. Yeah, I love it. Well, Barton, thank you for taking the time today. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. I, I really appreciate it. And yeah, we'll look you up for sure if you make it out to uh, San Francisco, has been on my list for a long time. I haven't really been. So, been around. Oh, there. yeah. Yeah, there's lots of great places, you know, venues out here for shows and everything. And it's mm -hmm. a good thing. It's like um, always somewhere to see a good show. So absolutely. Out. <laughs> All right, man. Well, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. It's great talking to you. Absolutely.
That was the interview with Barton Stanley David here on Concert Pipeline. And that takes us to the final segment on the program, Jens. What is it? Well, Steve, it's time to talk about uh, what we always talk about at the end of our segment, and that is music news. <laughs> That is right. Uh, we each have a couple of stories to share about what's going on in the music world uh, as we wind out the, the podcast. First of all, I hope you're sitting down, Jens, because this is this is big news. Okay, this is big news. I am sitting down. I am ready for whatever. So okay, um, we talked a couple months back uh, last year about Smash Mouth. Um, you remember uh, their lead singer Steve Harwell had a final show that did not go very well. He's suffering through a lot of different let's call them ailments of diff uh, different abilities, and he retired from the band Smash Mouth. Does this ring a bell? Hmm. No. Okay, fair I enough. I don't remember yesterday, man. This was last year. <laughs> <laughs> this is, this is last, last year at some point. Um, and, uh, and so, but the, the band Smash Mouth said they would go on. I'm like, how do you go on without Steve Harwell? He's kind of the right. backbone of that band, and the rest of the band has gone through so many iterations that, um, that it's like okay there's no inconsistency it's like it's okay to hang up the flag and you know with the you know millions of albums that you sold uh and and mm -hmm. thousands of car commercials and uh, and everything you've been in and and disney movies and everything along those lines right it's okay right. To, to hang up the towel uh, after 30 years um uh, or whatever it was as a band well they uh they announced their uh their new singer today Jens. they did they did. Uh, is, it, let me guess, is, is, it the, is it the replacement singer uh, for Journey? <laughs> yes, it's uh, it's Arnell. He's double tasked. Arnell. Uh, yeah. It's Smash Mouth now. Okay, it's not that. Uh, let me guess. It's uh, Axel Rose. Yes, he's. Uh, it, you're getting it every time. All right, good. Um, <laughs> that's all I got. I can't think of anyone else who's permanently it's or okay. temporarily replaced are, the lead singer. <laughs> You won't get it. It's, it's a guy named Zach Good, G O O D E, um, and um, and they reveal their new singer via a Rick Ashley cover, uh, and uh. Um, and his previous gigs include fronting a Weezer cover band called Geezer. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so they uh, they did a cover of uh, Rick Ashley's "Never Gonna Give You Up." Um, yes, there's video. Uh, Never heard of it. Yeah, and so uh, the new Ashley cover, Smash Mouth, have revealed that Zach Good will be their new singer. Um, his uh, he was in a band called Ghoul Spoon, uh, divided by zero and Secret Seven, uh, and a job mm -hmm. fronting a mock senior citizen Weezer slash Beastie Boys performance art band called Geezer. Uh, so, uh, um, so they have this like never going to give you up that they did. Let's listen to just a clip of that. Okay, we're going to skip ahead. Hold on. It kind of sounds like it has that smash mouth feel to it. I don't want to play too much because then we get tagged for <laughs> copyright or whatever. You know? Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, it sounds, um, it's not bad. Um, it's not a Rickroll thing, though, right? Uh, and I mean, I that's what I'm wondering, right? Is this all a joke? I mean, they, but it's not. I mean, you go to the Smash Mouth website and they have a picture with them and everything of the new with the new singer, and uh, uh -huh. so yeah, I've I've reached out requesting an interview, no word back yet. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see. Um, we'll see, but uh, uh, we'll see what happens. But uh, I mean, that's a good intro. Can never go wrong with some. Uh, never gonna give you up. Never gonna let you down. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. So anyway, that's the breaking news. Uh, new singer for Smash Mouth. Um, yes, Jens, you have a story for us. Yes. Um, so we didn't uh, see our movie over the weekend. Um, we didn't. And apparently, there are a lot of other movies I haven't seen uh, over the weekend or earlier than that. Uh, one. <laughs> uh is related to a is a disney movie um 
with a song in it that is has become quite popular. So, um, quote, we don't talk about Bruno, unquote, from Enchanto. Encanto. 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 That's, that's not what we wanted. That's not what we wanted. What are we doing? Get out of here. Beats the Billboard Hot 100 for the fifth week. Steve, what is this song? We gotta listen to this. It's just, I mean, it's a Disney song. I don't know like what else to say about it other than t in the world of TikTok, there have been so uh, many different parodies of We Don't Talk About Bruno. We Don't Talk About School or something, you know, I think is one of my kids were watching. Oh, uh, you know, there's- Oh, I see, it's so, a part of the chorus. We don't talk about, yeah, you can probably play a lot with, uh, with that. Yeah, so it's, you know, and by the end, it, talk, uh, it ends up with, we do talk about Bruno or something. I, I don't know. But it's, I don't know why that's the hot, hottest song right now, but it's been on the top of the charts for five weeks. Five I think, weeks. Right? Yep, yep. Five weeks at number one. Uh, Bruno now boasts more weeks at the summit than the other two leaders from Disney movies combined. That's, which is crazy because... Uh, I, I heard, and this seems to confirm that, that this is bit bigger than Let It Go by Frozen. Yeah, and, and that's the first thing that I thought of, you know, um, when you were mentioning that it became popular on social media. And uh, I can't imagine something more, you know, a Disney song or a song from a Disney movie that's more popular than Let It Go. I mean, that was I know, all over I know. the place. Let It Go shattered everything, right? Like, uh, yeah. <laughs> Frozen was huge back when that, it, that came out. It really, 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 really was. Um, so I guess the cast uh, sings this. So they're yes, all singing, that's, that's uh, true. <laughs> as the characters <laughs> the that had the voice in the movie. So that's the, uh, you know, I guess the, um, uh, I forgot what the word is I'm trying to think of. Um, so anyway, yeah, so it definitely extends the, uh, it's marked for the most weeks at number one. I mean, it's got to be the whole social media thing that's making that number one, right? I can't believe it's the it's the I song mean, itself. Just, I don't know. I mean, but I mean, the, so, uh, everything on social media just I think helps boost it up even mm -hmm. more, right? It helps get it yeah. out there. So yeah, yeah. So I just mean, uh, I, a few a few metrics. So uh, Bruno drew twenty nine point nine million U.S. streams. Seven point nine like million. That radio play audience impressions and sold 6,600 downloads. 6,000? So it sold 6,600 downloads. That's like, that's sad. That's number one. And that's how yeah. many downloads? It's, it, that's, oh, that's wow. confusing. Yeah, right? It's like, <laughs> like this is where we're at with, with music sales. No one is buying music anymore. Yeah. That's what I'm hearing. But they're that's streaming. What it sounds it. like, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, that's that's fine, I guess. So, um, yeah. Okay, that's well, ready to go Disney. Yeah, go Disney, right? Um, okay, so this next story ends is about a, a band who's been on Concert Pipeline in the past, uh, and that is Gang of Four. Um, so they canceled their Gang Toronto four? gig. Four F O U R. Gang of Four. Oh my God. Okay. Wow. <laughs> Gang of four. Where's your mind, Jens? Uh, I, I'm just hearing what you're saying, man. Yeah, apparently. Uh, they canceled their Toronto gig after the tour bus catch fire, caught fire. Um, and it's unclear whether anyone was injured in the blaze. Uh, but I'll tell you, this sounds like a sign because uh, they're in the middle of a North American tour, which has seen former Slint bassist David Paho joining the band on guitar. Last night, they were set to perform in Toronto's Horseshoe Tavern, but took to social media to reveal the news of their bus had caught fire. They shared photos of the firefighters tending to the blaze. Um, and it's, uh, uh, let's see here. There's, uh, this is the first time they were performing live. I mean, they, for, on these shows since the death of Andy Gill, uh, who's mm. one of the band founders in February, 2020. Uh, but they're set to resume their tour. Um, tomorrow night at the Crystal Ballroom in uh, Somersville, Massachusetts. So I guess the show goes on. 
I didn't know mm -hmm. that the band would be continue. This is another like Smash Mouth. Like it's like okay, this band has been around forever and has uh, inspired many other bands like Green Day and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and you would think that when their, you know, when their founder died, it's like it's okay to you know let it go. But if I guess if they want to keep playing, they can. But when your bus catches fire, maybe that's a sign that you know you were probably supposed to stop when Andy Gill died. Yeah. No, no. I don't know. Words of wisdom. Those are yeah, deep, right. deep thoughts. Yeah, deep thoughts. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I need to meditate on that. <laughs> yeah. You have one more story for us, Jens. Uh, I do. Uh, so, uh, New York City. Yes. Uh, removes proof of vaccination rule for gig venues. That's big. I wonder if that is here to stay. So New York City has got its groove back, says Mayor Eric Adams. Uh, gig goers in New York City are no longer required to provide proof of vaccination against COVID to gain entry into live events. That's huge. Um, so as the office of the New York City Mayor Eric Adams confirmed, on Friday, just a few days ago, uh, the key to New York City's vaccine mandate was removed. Oh, that's actually today, okay. Um, so from now on, people visiting indoor venues, including restaurants, fitness facilities, and entertainment establishments, don't need to show that they are protected against the virus before being admitted. However, such settings will still have the flexibility to require proof of vaccination or masking indoors if they choose to do so, but it's no longer required by the city. I mean, that's kind of, it's big, right? So, I mean, do you, where do you, what do you feel, Jens? Do you think we're past this thing? Like, I was looking at the numbers locally and they're freaking low for COVID mm -hmm. now. I mean, do you think we finally are ready to move forward? I don't know. I mean, I'm really, really, really hoping yes, but I'm still super, super, super hesitant. Yeah. Um, you know, we've had a couple of, of, this whole COVID thing is like a roller coaster, right? We've had a couple of, uh, uh, there've been a couple of times where we're like, okay, I think it's over, I think it's over. Yeah, I'm gonna have to mask pretty soon, you know? And then boom, another variation hits and then another variation hits. And uh, I'm skeptical, but uh, cautiously optimistic. As they there say. you go. Yeah, they do say that. And, you know, it's, it's weird. Like, I mean, a lot of people are still taking it seriously and masking in grocery stores mm -hmm. and stuff. And so I, yeah. I kind of do that same usually out of respect. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. Because it's kind of respecting and not worried about it, really. Right. I know. Around here, anyway, um, mm -hmm. everyone is still masking uh, inside. Um, and just like you said, it's more of a, a respect thing, I think. Um, but yeah, you know what? If 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 there's no other you know crazy variant that that comes you know before the end of this year, then I'll probably be feeling a lot better. That you, have, you just you want to make it through the rest of the year. It's the norm. To, yeah. To know for sure. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I I tell you, I am excited that the kids get to take their their masks off at school as of next week. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so that's pretty big. Um, I mean, because it's just so important for early childhood development and to be able to see your mm -hmm. peers and, and teachers' facial expressions to, to you learn from that, you know? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, so good stuff. And one more story for us, Jens, as we wind out the show. It's about Dave Grohl, who we did not see in uh, his in the horror movie comedy theater. movie. <laughs> but... Uh, but he does have a, a new song that he uh, that was released. It's a Liam Gallagher song, um, you know, mm. and and, um, and so Dave Grohl said that Liam Gallagher it was one of the last remaining rock stars. Uh, Liam Gallagher has Liam Gallagher from Oasis has responded to this uh, statement saying he's correct. The rest of them are useless. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> oh my God! Uh, the arrogance. Yes, yeah, so, uh, Gallagher has a, a new song, Everything's Electric. Um, Dave Grohl plays on that. Uh, it's from his upcoming new solo album, Come On You Know, which is set for release on May 27th. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, the song was co-written by Dave Grohl, who plays drums on the track, and is producer, produced by Greg Kirsten, 
uh, who is Dave Grohl's partner in crime in the um, in the Hanukkah sessions. Uh, they did the Hanukkah oh. sessions. They played bottle uh, bottle rock together on that small stage. There's their secret set, um, and uh, so they both did this track with uh, Liam Gallagher. Um, and um, yeah, Grohl said, "Unfortunately, we didn't do it in person, but I love being in the same room as Liam." Um, it's uh, like putting a fucking quarter in a jukebox and turning it up with that guy. It's fucking great. Obviously, he's an amazing singer and he's a fucking rock star. He's one of the few last remaining rock stars. And go, uh, uh, a fan asked Gallagher, uh, LG, how does it feel to be named one of the last remaining rock stars by Dave Grohl? He said, he's correct. The rest of them are useless, as I mentioned before. That was his, that was his exact reply. So, uh, oh, good yeah. times. Good times. I think Dave Grohl is one of the last remaining rock stars. That's my thought on it. Matter. Yeah, that's my thought. Yeah, that's my thought too. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, definitely. Definitely. I mean, that, they go without a doubt, of course. of course. I don't know how you could think about it any differently. <laughs> you can't. You can't. <laughs> well, that's our show for today, Jens. Uh, thank you again to Barton and Stanley David for being on the program. Um, thank you very much. Again, the, the shows go on in uh, upcoming weeks. We have uh, interviews lined up with Riot Act. Um, and uh, Albert Cummings, uh, among others that are uh, being worked on. Um, so uh, for all of us here at Concert Pipeline, that's Jen Schiphol. And that is Steve Jones. We'll catch you next time.